All right. All right. Welcome, everybody, to Parsha class. Uh, beginning of a new cycle of Parshiot from the beginning, from Bereshit itself. And uh, it's very, uh, it's a beautiful moment. Um, obviously, we're filled with, uh, we're surrounded by a lot of darkness. And just like uh, Hashem created light of uh, the new creation, perhaps. In the time of darkness, so we too, in uh, learning Torah, might be able to uh, equally, yeah, maybe not equally. <laughs> Obviously, we're not we're not uh, Hashem, but in some ways, learning of Hashem's Torah will enlighten the world and hopefully bring peace and safety to everybody. So let's uh, let's begin with no further ado. Quick summary of the Parsha. I think this is a very well-known Parsha, Bereshit. It's uh, the creation of the world, the seven days of creation, uh, the seventh day being Shabbat, uh, the creation of Adam and Chava, Adam and Eve, and uh, their subsequent eating from the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and then uh, the uh, the murder of uh, of one one brother murdering another, uh, Cain killing Hevel, and um, then also a very important incident, uh, we have the, the, then the ten generations, uh, at least some of them are listed between um, uh, between we go, between um, uh, between uh, Adam and Noah, Noah is mentioned at the end of the Parsha. We'll, we'll actually speak about him a little bit at the end of the class today, God willing, um, how he is indeed uh, given, he's sort of chain, some sort of compassion or, or love by Hashem that basically uh, l- frees him from uh, uh, otherwise um, not being able to, uh, uh, not, not dying during the time of the flood. All right. So, um, uh, if everybody could just uh, mute their microphones, please. All right, so we're going to go straight into the sources as a quick summary of the Parsha in a nutshell, a five minute uh, thing. But uh, the main learning we're going to be doing, God willing, uh, in just a moment will be uh, right here in the Parsha sheet that I sent out to everybody. And uh, Ruby, it's good to see you. I hope everything is safe over there. Uh, hope you're well. And uh, okay, so let's uh, let's get right into it. Vayasu Lokim et Shneham Orot. We're back to the creation of the world, the fifteenth, sixteenth chapter uh, verse of the Torah. Still talking about the creation of the world. And very often throughout the definitely the first chapter of Bereshit, if not elsewhere, certainly uh, it does talk about um, it does ask um, it does mention sorry that uh, Hashem's name is Elohim for whatever reason there are good seven or eight reasons I could name you now about how Hashem is uh, the master and Hashem is the judge according to Rashi uh, according to Sforno Hashem is nitzkiut. he's he's constant he's always there whatever the reason might be that that uh, and, and, and and when we think of always you sometimes think about future you know Hashem will always be there one of the crazy things to think about basically we can't probably can't even imagine it but Hashem was always there. Hashem was constant. Hashem was there before anything. There, when there was nothing, Hashem was there. Uh, it, it's, it, we have a hard, it, we have a hard time imagining nothing. Uh, and so, 
that that kind of nisu, that's why it mentions the name of Elohim so often. But in this particular verse, we're going to talk about the great luminaries. V'yas Elohim et shnei ha'orot ha'gdolim. Hashem created the, on, this, on this day, Hashem created the, uh, the, the moon and the sun. So it's on the fourth day. He created the great luminaries. Et ha'or ha'gadol, le'mamshelet hayom, the great luminary that rules over daytime. That's the sun, those of you who don't know. Et ha'or ha'katon, and then the small, the smaller luminary. That rules overnight, that Hakochavim and the stars. That's what Hashem created on the fourth day. Rashi on the verse. There are a lot of important Rashi's to learn in, in this parsha. Uh, very fundamental Jewish ideas, but unfortunately, it's not always easy to understand the Rashi unless you learn it a little bit in depth, as we're going to try to do. So he says he ham orat hagdolim shavim. It says the great luminaries. That implies, says Rashi, that they were equal. The sun and the moon were of equal size. Now, by the way, it's worth mentioning that in a sense, they are of very unusual size, the sun and the moon, and especially in relation to Earth. As you know. There is such a thing as an eclipse when the ball of uh, of the moon and the ball of the sun sort of line up against each other in our per, in, in, in our view, right? In our perspective, they line up in such a way as to basically cover up the sun. So what's interesting is that the size of the moon and its distance from Earth is exactly the right size for that to happen. And cover up the sun exactly. So that that's an amazing, unexplained scientific event. Still uh, unexplained. There's no real reason for the size of the moon and the distance from the Earth to uh, to to make that happen, but it does. But aside from all that, according to Rashi, as we're going to see, he's going to quote a, a midrash right now. When they were first created. The sun and the moon were of equal size, exactly equal, whatever whatever that size was. Shavim nivra'u v'nid ma'ata halavana al ha'kitruga. But the moon decided to get uh, to uh, to uh, to uh, to complain. Right, the moon complained. Amran she said, "Ef shar l'shnei malachim she ishtamshu becheta echad." It's not possible for two kings to rule over one keter, over one crown. In other words, we can't be equal. We can't two. We can't both be kings. We can't be prime minister and president. There's only one king. See, the you or me, son. Make up your mind. So Hashem decided. Okay, you want to be. You want to be bigger than the than the sun. You want to be the you want to be the king. So I'm going to make you smaller, and that's why the sun and the moon are not the same size anymore. That's why the moon is smaller than the sun. Which is, first of all, let's start out with uh, scientifically accurate. <laughs> the moon is by far smaller than the sun, smaller than the Earth, for goodness' sake. It is only a a satellite of the of the Earth. So it is, it is quite smaller than the sun. And the reason for that size difference is because here it complained that there should not be two rulers over one, with one crown. The Ibn Ezra has a problem with this because what, what Rashi is saying is that when the Torah says, the great luminaries, that phrase itself, the great luminaries, implies that they have to be equally great. They're both great. And so they have to be diminished. But says the Ibn Ezra, Yishai 
הגדולים כנגד האחרים. Sorry, this is not the right Ibn uh, Ezra. Sorry. Sorry, sorry. Um, uh, uh, so, so basically, yeah, so he says, this is the right one. Never mind. Um, the fact that uh, Rashi is saying that these are both equal, the sun and the moon, he says that's not necessarily true. We have uh, when the sons, uh, when the when the older brothers of David Amelech are mentioned, it also calls them the great ones. They're not equally great. They're not equally the same. Everything one's older than the other, right? Exactly. They're not. They're not all you know triplets or whatever, quadruplets. No triplets. The three sons, uh, besides David. So yeah. So uh, they couldn't. They weren't all equal just because they're all called great. They're just all older brothers. They're older than, they're older than David. As opposed to the sun and the moon, which are the great luminaries. Doesn't mean they're equally great luminaries. They're just greater than, let's say, the earth or whatever. Which, by the way, the moon is not, scientifically. All right, not, uh, not, not going to make too much of a point about that. So how are we going to... He concludes by saying, by the way, just we're not going to get into it now. Yesh lo sod. Sometimes he concludes his comments like that to imply that there is some something deeper, mystical about this uh, this particular. There's a lesson to be learned here on on sort of the Kabbalistic plane, but uh, for uh, obvious reasons, we're going to skip that for now, and we're going to jump right into the Kol Eliyahu by the Vilna Gaon, not written in his lifetime, but written based on different talks he gave. So the Vilna Gon is going to try to attempt to save Rashi, to defend Rashi. Again, Rashi said that when the Pasuk, the verse says, the great luminaries, that they're equal, the sun and the moon, and then they became unequal. Ibn Ezra says, nobody said that they're equal. They're just both great. Two great luminaries, just like David's two, you know, three big brothers. So these are two great luminaries. It doesn't have to be where, is it, where do you see that they're great, equally? So the Vilna Gon quotes Rashi, as we just said, and uh, right from the Gemara in Hulin. Uh, and then it says that they're equal. And then, say, then he quotes the Ibn Ezra, who says, how do you know they're equal? So he says, you want to know how they know? You know what? You want to know how Rashi knows that they were equal, yesh levar, we can explain, ki yodea shekvar kiblu chazal al mamar shnei, sheyu shnei hem shavim. The rabbi has learned out. He's going to say later, he's going to say here, let's just uh, read it Read it inside and I'll explain. Kemo shemavor b'mesechet yoma, is explained in, in the mesechet yoma, One moment. Uh, right. The Shnei Seire Yom Kippurim Akatu Bahem Gibapamim Shnei Hayamukrach Liyot Shavim Begimel Dvarim. So the fact that in the Talmud in Yoma, when it talks about the two goats, one for Azazel and one for Hashem, it says over and over again that there's Shnei, two of them. And because it says Shnei three times, the Gemara learns out that they're supposed to be equal in three different things. So because it mentions Shnei, the word Shnei, which means two, or both, it says both of them, and it says it three times. So the goats of uh, for Hashem and Azazel, they have to be equal in three different things, in size, in color, in age, whatever it is, they're supposed to all be equal. Now, what's interesting is Basically, the Gemara is implying that when you use the word shnei, when you use the word both, you're saying that they're both equal. Shnei means equal. It doesn't say this, uh, the luminary and that luminary. It says shnei hamorot, right? As the verse says, let's go back to the original verse that Rashi's uh, 
commenting on v'yask elokim et shnei hamaorot hagadolim. He made the two great luminaries. It didn't have to mention that there are two. The fact that it mentions shnei says uh, says the Vilna Gon is why Rashi has to say that they were equal because shnei means equal. That's why the Gemara Yuma says that over and over again, those three times regarding the uh, regarding those. Uh, luminaries uh, regarding the the sorry the goats. All right, so that's uh, that's how we're going to start. Again, we have a comment from Rashi. We have a dispute with Ibn Ezra. Then we have the Vilna Gon from 250 years ago popping in with actually here's why Rashi says what he does, and it's not just uh, it's not just uh, uh, his guess. And this is why they have to be equal to begin with. And why the, the Midrash needs to explain, the Gemara, why the Gemara and the Midrash need to explain why it is that they are no longer equal. All right, let's skip 10 verses to chapter 1, verse 26. And again, it's worth remembering. We can have probably easily a year long class on Parshat Bereshit alone. Maybe even the first chapter of Parsha Parishit could be a whole class. Uh, there's so much to say, and we're we're skipping around. And it's important to remember we don't really fully understand all of what's going on in how Hashem created the world. Now, it's not like this is Hashem's giving us the formula, and all you have to do is you know reproduce this in your kitchen, and you've you, you've made a little world of your own. We, we don't entirely understand it all. There's a lot of commentary. Rashi, Ramban, or Achaim, etc., uh, to help us understand things as best we can. But really, there's only lessons that we can learn from this. There isn't so much that we can learn from the his, you know, historically about how the world was created. Although, if you recall, to point out the first time we learned Bereshi together, whether it was three years ago or whatever it was, I, I brought in uh, some sources from uh, Dr. Gerald Schroeder. You can find this on in the, in the video uh, from three years ago. From if you look on the playlist there on YouTube, you'll find that uh, there's some sources there from um, the Science of God by Dr. Gerald Schroeder, where he explains how the verses of uh, of Bereshit sort of line up with uh, some current uh, scientific theory. All right, uh, we'll leave it. We'll leave it at that. Let's uh, again. Let's jump to chapter one, verse twenty six. Uh, let us make man according uh, according to a an image uh, you know appropriate for us and a lot of commentaries deal with and we've spoken about this in years past about how Hashem is speaking in the plural let's let us make man as if Hashem needed any, anybody else's help so there's there's what to say there but not for today and they are going to be the bosses. They will rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the air and the animals on the land and everything that uh, the, everything else that lives. Mankind will be in charge. Says the Meshachachma. What does it mean to make Adam in our image or an image appropriate for us? So, Nasa Adam et Salmanob had Selem Ha'elokaihu. This means the godly Selem, the godly, God's image. All mankind is made in God's image. What does that mean? Habichira Ha'chavchit, that this is free will. Bli Teva Machriach Rak Mirzon. Uh, we have something that nothing else in nature has. We have free will because we have a free imagination and free thought to do whatever we want. That doesn't, you know, that, that doesn't mean. Uh, I heard from Rav, uh, I heard my Rosh Hashiva said the name of of Elia Lopian. It's not that we have the ability to do what we want. Because everything does what it wants. 
And every animal in the world does what it wants. What we are able to do is we're able to do what we don't want, right? We have uh, we have a choice. We have a, a delicious, you know, steak in front of us, and we can say no to it. No other creature can do that, right? We uh, we can we can say we can look at it. We can, we can we ask, "What's the hechsher? Oh, this is a hechsher I don't trust. I don't like whatever." And uh, and not eat the steak, even though it looks delicious and looks healthy or whatever else. And you can say no to it. Nevertheless, that's real free will. The, the, the power to control yourself and not do what you want, that's free will. So he goes on to say that um, so he is uh, if, if you, and by the way, you, you might not have noticed, I didn't really point it out, but in all of the days of creation, when Hashem creates the day, he says, Hashem ra'ah ki, uh, ki hayom ki tov. He said that the world, that, that that day was good, right? He said, he made, he made the, he made the, for example, the sun and the, the sun and the moon, and he said, he said the day was good. When he, when it comes to the creation of man, this is the verse about the creation of man, it doesn't say ki ra Hashem ki tov. It doesn't say kitov regarding man. It's almost like it's not good that God created man. So the uh, Meshachachim explains, yedato enu ki en yedato ba ba rak ki atzmuto rambam hine im ki en lahavin the fact is that although it's a great thing that we have free will, it's only free will that we have that allows us to ignore the fact that there's a God in the world. Everything else knows this very well because they don't have free will. Because they don't have free will, they have no idea. They have no. They, they can't imagine. They don't have the imagination. They don't have the free thought to be a free thinker, and uh, and and, th- and 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 imagine that there's a. They can't imagine the idea that there isn't a God. It's stupid for them. It's ridiculous. They know for sure that there's a God because they don't have free will. Our free will as good as it is, comes with a very important downside. And that is it also gives us the ability to ignore the obvious and to focus on one thing. And sometimes that thing is right, and but it could be that we can focus on the wrong thing and think that that's right when it's actually wrong. You know, all the mishigasim in the world, all the craziness, whether it's religious or political or whatever else, that happens only because we're humans and have free will. So yes, free will is great, but it's a great power, but it comes with a very, very amazing and scary responsibility. We also have to we also have to rein in that free will to use it for good. And sometimes we don't, as we see in the news lately. There are human beings who have free will who are using that free will to do terrible. I mean, un, un, undescribably evil things, right? So they, they can do that because they have free will. And not necessarily the seichel, the wisdom to rein it in and to use it for the proper things. And that's why it doesn't say about the creation of man, the sixth day it does not say about it, kitov, that it was good, because it wasn't necessarily good. There's some great evil in the world only because of this. So th- that's uh, that's worth mentioning. And uh, and with that, we're going to skip to um, to a little bit more um, still in the creation of the world. We're, we're going to be in the next chapter already. Chapter 2 in Bereshi, chapter 2, verse 5. Right before the creation of man, more or less, Hashem said, 
Hashem, this is what Hashem does. The whole siyach hasadeh terem yeh ba'aretz. Um, there was no, there was no trees or fields in uh, in, in all of uh, in all of the the land. We call Ezov Hasadeh Terem Yitzmach, and uh, there's no pastures. Kilohim to Hashem Elokim et Ha'ar Al Ha'aretz. The Hashem did not rain. There was no rain. Not rain like uh, Hashem didn't rule. Hashem definitely ruled, but he didn't he didn't create rain. Why? There was no man. There was no man to work the land yet. So until mankind came into existence, it didn't rain, and so there's no actual herbage or, or trees in the field. Says Rashi, and again, we're going to have another Rashi that is going to require some explanation. And Rashi says, Ma tama lo himti. Why didn't it rain? Why hadn't it rained yet? Simple. Lefisha adamayin. Because there was no man. There's no man to work the land. And he wouldn't have appreciated rain. So first man was on the earth. And there was no rain. And then rain came down, and things started to grow, and that's when man began to appreciate. Man began to appreciate uh, the the rain. Okay, Sheba Adam v'yada Shehem Tzorech Leolam, and when man realized that this was necessary for the world, he t'palal alehem v'yardu v'tzamchu ha'ilanot v'hasad had the shine. And that's when Hashem, that's when Adam realized that this was obviously something that was good for the earth, and he prayed. And when he prayed for them, that's when it started to rain, and that's when trees and other herbage started to grow. All right, Baruch Hashem. Says the Guru Arya, that's the, the Maral in his commentary. Says, so, so wait, 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 it didn't rain because there wasn't a person to appreciate it. <laughs> There's a lot of things God created that there was no man to appreciate yet. The sun and the moon were created before Hashem, before Adam. Adam didn't need to appreciate the sun and the moon. Adam didn't need to appreciate the animals. Adam didn't need to appreciate the fish. Okay, some people don't appreciate fish. Right? <laughs> but the, the, be honest. Why, why only rain needs to be something appreciated? So, Ein Makir Betuvatan, the Guru Ari, the Maral explains that uh, Rashi is trying to say, Kolomar Vaaser Lato Tova Leisha Ein Makir Betova. We have a concept. You should not do something good to someone who's not going to appreciate that good. You shouldn't do it. It says Aser. In fact, it says the Ficha calls man Shlo Haya Adam. As long as it wasn't man, Lo Ham Himtir. That's when it didn't rain. But what about everything else that God created? They were made for themselves. Rain wasn't made for itself. Rain was made for man. And so you can't just make, make rain and, uh, and before mankind so man wouldn't appreciate it. Animals are for themselves. Sometimes man uses them, sometimes he doesn't. There's plenty of times, plenty of animals we don't use at all. I don't remember the last time I used a hippopotamus, right? A dog, okay, maybe we use, we use dogs, cats, whatever, domesticated animals or semi-domesticated, whatever you want to call them. But there's plenty of animals that are out in the, in the world that have no effect on my life at all. I don't remember the last time I was affected by, uh, by the existence of a wombat. Okay, so it doesn't affect me. I guess I want to see it, maybe you know, visit it at the zoo, but uh, it, it could be cute, it doesn't matter. That's uh, they don't affect me, not really, right? I wouldn't, uh, it's the they, they could exist for themselves as they do without affecting me at all. But rain is different. So rain is a tova, says the Guru Arya. Rain is a good. 
so I read and I thought I'd share it here with you from Rav Yaakov Galinsky in his the Higareta, the series of books he has. So this is from his volume on um, on Elul and Rosh Hashanah. Very appropriate, I think. So he says, let's take a look at the following pasuk and see what Rashi has to say about it. He quotes our pasuk, our, our verse, Bereshit 2.5, and he says the Rashi, just like I said, he says, every child knows this Rashi because there's no one to pray for rain. The rain didn't fall. That's how children basically learn that. But that's a mistake. That's not actually what Rashi says. Because there was no man to work the soil and no one recognized the benefit of rain. The morale in this commentary says, It's forbidden to do a favor to someone who won't appreciate it, as we said. So says Rav Yaakov Galinsky, we receive so much, and all we can think about is what we don't have. We constantly ask and focus on what we still don't have, on our curses. Is there any greater ingratitude than this? Did we sign a contract that says we have to have everything? Everywhere around us are tragedies and troubles, people with health problems, people who have lost their jobs, people who have lost their homes, to the fires and earthquakes and other calamities, especially this week. I think we can, uh, can appreciate this. And we, we have the apple, and all that's missing is the honey. What do they say on high? It is, for, In other words, what does Hashem say? It is forbidden to do a favor for someone who won't appreciate it. This is not the way. It is not to our benefit to change. It is, sorry, it is to our benefit to change our attitude. First of all, we need to recognize the good in our lives. First, we need to be thankful for what we have. That we should have, that we should not lose it, that we should continue to have it. Then we can daven. Thank you, Rabboni Shalom, that you gave us a year with so much bracha, so much good. And then looking at that year through this lens, we say, may the year end along with its curses. That whatever we felt wasn't perfect, we should have the next time. Thank you for the apple itself. And now please add the honey. Right? So this is a good kavanah to have next year, Rosh Hashanah. The bracha we make is over the apple, not the honey, right? So it's, especially when these terrible things are happening in our lives, and uh, no matter no matter how far away it's happening, it's happening to our lives. It's happening to us. So when, uh, especially those, those of us in America, we might be asked by our bosses, by our coworkers, you know, do you have any family in Israel? Do you have any friends in Israel who are affected? The answer is yes. The answer is not, oh, let me think about it. Oh, my cousin was there, but he moved. He lives in Seattle now. It doesn't matter where your cousins live. We're all family. We have 6 million relatives in Israel who are struggling right now, who are suffering right now, who are scared right now. And so we are all, we are all affected. All of our family is affected. But the focus should not be on, oh, poor us, we're, uh, we're, we're victims. The focus should be Baruch Hashem for what I do have. We do have our lives. We do have a state of Israel. We do have security. We do have Hashem protecting us. Yes, we have tragedies. Push that aside for a moment and focus on, on the good. Thank you, Hashem, for this. Thank you, Hashem, for that. Please avenge. Please keep safe. Please bring back, etc. Please heal. Yes. But thank you for what we do have also is an important Kavanah to have through this time. Okay, we're going to skip two verses to more about the creation of man. Hashem in his Torah tells us in chapter 2, verse 7, Hashem Elokim et Adama. Here, Hashem is not called Elokim, but Hashem Elokim. There's a lot to say about that, but not for now. Uh, he created Adam, Afar Min Adama. He created them. Dust from the um, from the earth, v'yipach ba'apav nishmat chaim, and he put into his into his nose, he put into the the living soul. The he adam adam lenefesh chaya, and adam became a living thing. In the targum, the unklus, the Aramaic translation, translates that last phrase as a human thing, as a living thing. It's, uh, everything, of course, Hashem put a living thing in our soul. 
uh, put a put a soul in us. So, so what is this living thing? So it says Unkelos Ruach Mimalala. Ruach Mimalala is Aramaic for a speaking being. Being a speaking being seems to be very important to us. But Rav Shimon Schwab in Mayan Beit Hashoeva asks, Targum Havod Adam Ruach Mimala, the fact that the Targum Uncles calls us a speaking being needs to be explained. Why? Adam was the only speaking being, and there was nobody to speak to, nobody with whom to speak. Lama Nivra im koach adibur im Why did he make Adam able to speak if there's nobody with whom to speak? What's the point? Why give him this talent? Give this to him later when there's somebody to talk to. The very essence of the power to speak that's Biha Adam, that's inside man. Just like we said regarding rain, the most important function of speech is tefila, is prayer. We are given the power to speak because we are. We're being told what to use that power for. There's nobody to talk to? Oh, yes, there is. HaKadosh Baruch Hu, the Abishter, Hashem is himself, a Borish Shalom. You can always talk to him. You're all alone. There's nobody to talk to? Wrong again. There is always somebody to talk to. There's Hashem. And he quotes uh, Rashi that we just spoke about with regard to to uh, to rain. All right, and he says, "Hare mishtachila and mishtachila tabria hutzuruchat fila haadam." The prayer of man was the necessary ingredient from the very beginning, from the very creation of the world. But alke nivra im koach adibur, and that's why he was given the strength to speak. But agav yesh la ayer shekavin sheikub tfila haita. It's interesting that of all the prayers, and this obviously connects to what we just said, of all the prayers, seems like the main prayer is a prayer for rain. Why? This is why if you forgot and mixed up your prayers and said the wrong prayer, you didn't say Mashiva Ruach, Marit HaGeshem at the right time, or you said Marit HaTal, or whatever. He mixed it up. Tzarech Lichzor Lerosh HaTefila. Your Tefila was a nothing, and you had to go all the way back to the beginning. Masha Enke Enim Dilag Shtayim Ushlosh HaTevot Acherot Be'em Tzatefila Shemona Esrei. If you mixed up two or three words anywhere else in Shemona Esrei, no big deal. In Machzirim Oto, you don't have to repeat them. Tzatefila HaGeshem Be'ed HaHutzrach Hu Ika HaTefila. Rain at the time when it's needed is the essence of tefillah. What is he saying? What is he talking about? Prayer is not just a communication. It's not, it's, it would be good if it was. It, it, at least that. For most people, unfortunately, I've not done a poll, but I understand from speaking to people, for most people, prayer and tefillah is just a rote behavior. Those people who do it, right? Those people who do it, do it because, oh, I was taught in, in, uh, in, Hebrew, in Hebrew school or whatever, I should say, Moda'ani when I wake up. I should say Asher Yatzar after I use the bathroom. I should say these brachot. I should say this. I should say that. I should pray three times a day. Whatever it is that, that you do, if all you do it for is because you were taught to do it and not because you feel it, not because you 
have the desire, the need to express yourself to the creator of the world and ask him for stuff you need to mention what you're lacking, to know that you don't have everything that you need and want, and to ha that you have a voice that's listening, you have an ear that's listening to your voice, then you're missing the point of tefillah. I heard somebody say recently, which I think it might have been uh, a tweet or whatever, an X, a communication on X, whatever it is. Right? I, somebody tweeted that, uh, that teaching a child the importance of minion and not teaching the child the importance of tefillah is the essence of bad chinuch, right? Yeah. You're needed in a minion because uh, they need 10 people. You'll be one of those 10 people. What are you doing while you're there? Doesn't matter. You're one of the 10 people you count. That's good enough. That's not chinuch. That's not properly teaching your child what they're supposed to do. What are you supposed to do in a minion? You're supposed to connect to Hashem. Where's Hashem? Hashem is all around you. You can connect to him without a minion. But it's easier to connect with him in a, with a minion. That's all a minion is. It's just, uh, it's just a booster to the power you already have. You have the power to connect to Hashem. If you're a man, a minion helps. If you're a woman, it doesn't hurt either, by the way. But uh, for a man, a minion helps. That's all. It's not, it's not the essence of prayer. Oh, I don't have a minion to go to, so I won't pray today. The minion doesn't need me, so I can just pray at home. You're missing the point. Your prayer is boosted by a minion, and your prayer is a communication to Hashem. Your voice goes into Hashem's metaphoric ear. Your literal voice goes into God's metaphoric ear, and whatever you want to say, whatever you want, whatever complaint or gratitude, whatever else you want to express, that's the time to do it. A Jewish male, three times a day at least. Plenty of other times while you're driving, while you're at work, when you're eating. There's plenty of other times to also communicate to Hashem, say to Hillam, especially now, important time for prayer. I'd like to conclude today's class with something we don't uh, usually get a chance to speak about, at least in this Parsha, but it's important because it's in the Parsha. The very, very end, a few last few verses of the of the parsha are a little confusing, and it's worth uh, at least bringing it up because we're going to read it not once but twice because it's it's also the uh, the maftir. Oh wait, not well, not this week, but usually it's the maftir. And uh, uh, let's uh, let's let's see what it says. So after everything, after Hashem created the world, and after Cain and Hevel, and after ten more generations, it says Vayar Hashem ki Raba Raat Adam ba'aretz. Hashem saw that man was very evil on the land. Bechol Yitzer Machshavot Libo, and all of the desires of the, the thoughts of his heart, rock rock Oyom, were, were evil all day long. Vinacham Hashem, Hashem regretted ki Asa et Adam ba'aretz. And Hashem created the, the uh, mankind on earth. And he was sad. It was obviously very mer metaphoric. Hashem doesn't regret anything because Hashem knows the future. And again, he's not sad because he doesn't have the same feelings. And definitely not El Libo. He doesn't have a heart because he doesn't have any physical body. But let's push that aside for the moment. Hashem. And Hashem said, I regret making mankind. I'm that I regret that I made them. So I'm going to destroy them. And then the last verse says, Noach found Chain, which is usually translated as grace. Let me see how favor, grace, okay. Favor or grace in the eyes of Hashem. What are we talking about here? Why does Hashem want to destroy the world? And why does Noah not fit into that category? Is he not a person? Is he a big tzaddik? We'll find out from the next, next verse, that the uh, next few verses it says, Noah ish tzaddik, 
that, that he was a tzaddik, but that's not what it says here. It's not like the world was evil, so Hashem wanted to destroy it, but Noah wasn't evil, so he was, he's not going to get destroyed. It seems very different here what's going on. And the Orachayim notices this as well. And so he writes, Utrach Lomar Kinichamti, the verse had to tell us, Hashem needed to say in his verse that he felt bad, that he regretted. Velo, he speak, the Mash Amar Besamoch. And it wasn't enough what it said earlier that he regretted making man. So obviously there's something, else, some other regret that's being mentioned here. Balomar Shatam Shaamar Emchehu Letzad Shinicham Al Asiyatam. So what he's regretting is that he made man to begin with. Not that they turned evil. Lola Tad Masehem Haraim. It's that's why it's underlined here. I, I underlined by me, right? Uh, it's it's not because they were evil that Hashem wants to destroy the world. It's not because the, of their evil. It's because he regrets the whole kitten caboodle, the whole project, project creating man is what Hashem is regretting. Kiyesh hefresh, and there is going to be a difference. There's a difference between saying that he regretted making man and he's regretting the fact that man is evil. What's the difference? If he would have destroyed them just as a punishment because of how they're behaving, because of their bad behavior, then there would, would not be anybody who's not going to be destroyed. Everybody would be destroyed. In other words, I'm punishing, let's say you're a teacher and you want to punish a class for misbehaving. Uh, you don't make exceptions. You punish the whole class. All of Kita Aleph will be punished. Right? Even the people who didn't necessarily sorry. So there, there might be even people if you're, uh, you're going to punish the people for being bad. Sorry. Other way around. Reverse, reverse course here. I'm not translating this correctly. So if if, uh, if if you're going to punish people for being bad, you'll punish the evildoers. Not everybody, not the whole world. Certainly not, for example, children, not babies, not people who haven't reached the, the maturity, the age of which they, they could be held liable. That's why, uh, you know, for those people who are outraged at the current behavior of some of uh, Israel's enemies, uh, a lot of the outrage is because they're literally hurting people who are not only defenseless but have not caused any harm. They can't be held reliable. They can't be held liable, and they are. So that's that seems like quite an injustice. <clears throat> but that's not what Hashem is doing here. Hashem is saying, "I regret creating mankind." Even those who haven't done anything wrong. Even the people who are old enough. But this destruction is because he regrets making mankind altogether. Both young and old are all included in the same gazera, in the same decree. They're all going to get wiped out. That's why he says, I regret, I'm going to destroy them because I regret making them at all. And because of that, there's not going to be any exceptions. They're all going to be killed. The, the flood will kill out everybody. And that's why Amar Tikev Yemiyad Noach matzachin be'ine Hashem. That's why it says Noach found grace or favor in the eyes of Hashem. Perush 
Lo litzad ma'asav. It's not because of his behavior. It's not because he was a good guy that he's an exception to the rule. Because there are no exceptions to the rule. The rule is, I want to wipe out mankind, good and bad. Hashem wanted to destroy all of mankind. And it doesn't matter that that Noah was was uh, was a tzaddik. That wouldn't have saved him. That's why it says he found favor, and it does not say that um, that he 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 earned the favor. Hashem just found favor in him, and that's why he decided to not destroy Noah. Not only that, this, by the way, does not prove or disprove that Noah was a tzaddik or not a tzaddik. Because if he was if he was righteous, the righteousness wouldn't have helped him. It wouldn't have uh, it wouldn't have caused Hashem to not, uh, uh, you know, turn back his anger. And uh, and uh, he would have destroyed the world anyway. So now he's going to tell you a very big secret that you might not have known before. There are certain things you can do to have this chen, this favor, this grace from Hashem. It's not just being a tzaddik. It's doing these particular mitzvot. Right? But Hashem did not tell us which mitzvot these are for obvious reasons. He doesn't want people to just do these mitzvot. Let's say, I'm not saying this is it. Let's say it's keeping kosher. Let's say keeping kosher is the mitzvah that's going to protect you in case Hashem decides to destroy the world. You'll be safe. You'll be in this magical bubble bomb shelter bunker and you won't be hurt because you keep kosher so then everybody's going to keep kosher for the wrong reasons they don't want to be hurt that's not what Hashem wants and that's why he doesn't advertise which mitzvot these are the protected Noah in this case all right Noah did these mitzvot and merited this chen not because he was a tzaddik, which he was, but not because of that, but only because he did this these particular uh, three, two or three mitzvot. Gam shemo yagid kain. Indeed, he says, uh, look at his name. His name implies that too, that Noach matzah chen. Because Noach and chen not only have the same gematria, they have the, literally the same letters. Nun and chet backwards is nun and chet, that's how you spell Noach, Backwards is chet and nun, which is how you spell chen, which is this favor and this grace. So, um, so what we have here basically is uh, is uh, it's very clear that Noah, as good as he was, we're going to learn more about how good he was next week. But at the end of this week's parsha, we need to know that Hashem regretted project create mankind. Noah wasn't included in this uh, in, in this the desire of Hashem's to destroy the world and regret this creation of, of mankind, not because it was a tzaddik particularly, but because he did three particular mitzvot that earned him this chen, this grace that anybody can really do. So how do we do it? Well, I guess you're going to have to do everything, hope for the best, because Hashem in his wisdom did not tell us what these mitzvot were, because Hashem doesn't want us to just do these two or three mitzvot and call it a day and uh, and, and live uh, live like animals the rest of our the rest of our lives. 
we need to do all 613 mitzvot, and two or three of those 613 are going to be the ones that protect us, God willing, and protect us from all evil, from all harm, certainly is going to protect us from any evil perpetrated by man. We should uh, we should hope that, again, learning of our Torah should be a schut for us and for all of Klal Yisrael and should uh, bring chayn and, uh, and uh, protection to all of our people. I'm going to stop the uh, live feed to Facebook. And uh, if there's any questions, you can ask them either now or on the YouTube uh, channel.